Hello, I'm Eric Christensen. I'm a research taxonomist. A taxonomist is a person who classifies things. I'm the type of guy who basically says, what is an oak tree and what is a maple tree? And then once I've done that, I decide what is a silver maple and what is a red maple. Um, I work with orchids and have kind of a uh, checkerboard career because I have several different interests. I'm interested in specific genera of plants, like maples, um, only orchids, in Asia, which is called monographic work, writing a monograph, a revision, or essentially writing a book that includes all the information on a particular group. I also have uh, very strong floristic interests in the Americas, particularly the last 10 years or so in Peru. And floristics is studying the plants of a given region. So in this case, I'm doing all the orchids of Peru. We estimate right now there are about 3,400 species of orchids in Peru alone. It's one of the most diverse countries on the planet. And then finally, I have a third interest, and I'm interested in horticultural plants. So essentially, if it's an orchid that's grown, no matter where it is in the world, I have an interest, particularly in trying to provide stable names for growers. Uh, one of the fields that really people don't put much emphasis into anymore is variation in plants uh, that are considered to be trivial or not important to the long-term evolution of the group. And of course, these trivial variations are incredibly important to horticulture. So when you're talking about the white-flowered form of a normally pink flower, you have to give the white-flowered plant a name. And the problem is one person may use Latin for white, one person may use a word from Greek for white. And so you can have the white form, this uh, uh, rare mutation, uh, under several different names in the nursery trade. And people like me, uh, with an interest in horticultural plants, try to clean those up and give one name so that everyone can be talking about the same thing. Uh, in my floristic work, what I'm really interested in is species level taxonomy. Some people study plant families, some people plant a whole genus like a maple, and then people like me study one particular species, uh, like human beings are a species. And the reason I have this interest particularly is I have a very strong conservation interest. And before you can do conservation, you have to have a stable name for a plant. You have to define what the plant is, how you recognize it, and how it differs from other relatives. And then finally, you have to know something about the distribution, uh, because with distribution data comes ecology. So one of the things I do is look at what we call highly variable species, you know, always in quotes, uh, because many highly variable species are actually several closely related species that are difficult or there's not enough material to study or for some reason uh, a scientist has yet to get to them. And a lot of these things are widespread, again, these combinations of things. So my interest is taking a species like Sarcoglottis acaulis, it's a green flowered species from the tropics. And it used to be recorded from uh, southern Mexico all the way down to Bolivia. Well, when you go to Trinidad, where it was originally described, you find out that it has certain characteristics that don't agree with plants on most of the mainland. And when I got through, I have at least five species. And so in the old days, uh, before my work, no one would care about the conservation because if it's from Mexico to Bolivia, it's gonna be hard to wipe it out no matter how many trees you cut down or roads you build. But when you redefine it, you realize that the one from Southern Mexico is just in Southern Mexico and Guatemala, and there's a one that's only in Ecuador and so on. And so you have to rethink all your conservation strategies. Um, and I'm very proud of that when it finally clicks. And it really is a matter of looking at these difficult groups and you kind of wake up one day and go, oh, that's how I recognize the thing from Ecuador. Um, you, know, you finally have to get enough comfort and knowledge with the plants and not just technical analysis before you get to realize what these you know, breeding groups are, these species. So those are my major interests uh, in orchids. I also have uh, an interest in history and a lot of what I do is from uh, museum specimens. And when you're in a uh, botanist, when they're in the tropics, uh, press plants. And you take a plant, you know, a flowering or fruiting plant, and put it between two sheets of newspaper and then some cardboard. And you either preserve it temporarily in alcohol or some other uh, preservative, or you dry them immediately or, and put them over a heat source. And gently, uh, all the moisture is taken out of the plant. And when you take all the moisture out of a plant, you have basically pure cellulose, just like paper. And so once you dry out a plant, if you glue it to a sheet of paper and keep it under you know, dry, normal conditions in a museum, it's permanent. And literally hundreds of years later, you can study it. And this has um, a lot of advantages for botanists because I can go to a large museum and get loans from other museums. And I have not just my collections of something, but I have the collections of all the botanists who traveled you know, throughout South America for the last 150 years. So I get, you know, it's like going to the tropics 500 times instead of just a couple times. 
But the thing that most people don't realize is that even though you dry plants and press them, they're not just to look at, like a, you know, like a dried wedding bouquet. Uh, you can take flowers, again, because they are just pure cellulose, and reconstitute them, either in uh, warm water or I use an ammonia method, and they come back to full three dimensions. Now, they don't have their color, uh, but the color is usually recorded on the specimen someplace. But you can take a 200-year-old you know, flower off a specimen, rehydrate it, and dissect it just like you had a flower sitting in alcohol on your, on your table. Uh, so it's, it's not a static collection. It really is an amazingly useful tool. The other reason that you need museum specimens is the naming of plants, which is a separate discipline called nomenclature, uh, requires permanent specimens. So you always need what we call type specimens. So if you want to know, for example, what is a red maple, well, the original red maple, which is described in the 1700s, is at Uppsala University in Sweden, and you can go and look at the specimen that the guy had in front of him in the 1750s and know exactly what he meant by a red maple. Uh, and one of the reasons plants change names is when we look at all these old specimens, we realize we were misapplying names we weren't putting it correctly. Uh, it's a, a very strange discipline because to do it well, you have to combine a lot of different interests. You have to like going to museums and looking at you know, dried specimens. You have to like slogging through mud in the tropics uh, and a lot of interesting literature. Uh, taxonomy is an unusual science uh, because it's the only science where every time you get a new piece of information, you always go back to the very beginning. Most other disciplines, like chemistry, for example, you really don't have to go back more than a few years in the literature. But people like me, if I'm studying the plants of Peru, for example, which is my, my major interest, um, the books I need most, one was in, from 1798 and one was in 1832, and I use them on a weekly basis because those, that's the ground, uh, the established groundwork for the, any knowledge of Peruvian plants. So that's what a taxonomist is. Thank you.